Welcome to Distressed to Joyful, Bailey's Way. I'm your host, Bailey Raber, here to enlighten you and the rest of the world about one of the most misunderstood mental disorders out there, bipolar disorder. Each week, we're going to learn more about my personal journey with the disorder while leaving you enriched with new information on how you can help better yourself as well as those around you. So for today, our topics are, we're going to first go over telling my friends about the diagnosis, whether or not I did so as soon as I found out. We'll talk about what it was like when I did tell them. We'll also cover how my boyfriend at the time reacted to the news of the diagnosis, whether or not my teachers at school knew about it. Plus, I'm also going to continue to encourage any of y'all out there listening who might need to seek help to go ahead and, of course, seek the help that you need. That's always going to be a constant encouragement from me to any of you out there, as well as appropriate ways to react to learning of a loved one who has recently been diagnosed. Okay, so did I tell my friends right away? (laughs) Absolutely not. So I was hurting and I felt very uncomfortable in my own skin because of the diagnosis. I felt broken and I didn't really want anyone else to know that side of me, especially considering how my family took to the news, if you remember back from last week's episode. But when I did finally tell my friends, I mean, gosh, I remember telling a close friend and then immediately regretting it afterwards because it seemed as if they were unsure of not only the disorder, but of just being in my presence now that I've been diagnosed. They looked as if they were now uncomfortable being near me and that really fucking sucked. It hurt really, really bad. And the problem with this entire situation is that I had absolutely no clue what this disorder meant for me and neither did my friends. But because I didn't know what it meant for me, I wasn't able to explain anything to them to help make them feel comfortable. I mean, I didn't even feel comfortable. How can you comfort somebody else if you're not even comforted first? But the term mental disorder seemed very weird and scary. And I'm pretty sure all anyone knew about mental illness at the time was from what they saw portrayed in movies, which is, of course, completely blown out of proportion. Completely. But just to clarify, y'all, there is nothing wrong or scary about any of us who have been diagnosed with a mental illness. It just means that we have to be a bit more patient with ourselves and ask the same of those around us while we learn how to cope with our uneven moods and emotions. That's it. And what's cool is that there are many, many ways in order to do so. Some of which I thoroughly enjoy and find fun, like how I manage my anger and (laughs) how I track my moods, which I'll go over later on. But moving on, so let's talk about when I told my boyfriend at the time about the diagnosis. He was my first real boyfriend. We went to bell dance together. And for those of you who are from the South, that was my high school's version of the Sadie Hawkins dance. For those of y'all who aren't from the South, a Sadie Hawkins dance is a school formal, like prom or homecoming, but where the girls ask the boys to be their dates, not the other way around where the dudes usually ask the girls. So all my friends were going, and I really needed a date to this dance, but I had absolutely no clue who to ask. I remember scanning my brain, thinking of all the guy friends I had, but all of them had girlfriends at the time. I was dead stumped, and I was like, guess I don't get to go. But then one of them mentioned this boy who had had his eye on me. And I thought, okay, sure, why not? And things seemed to flourish between us even after the dance. Well, it flourished as much as a relationship between two 16-year-olds in high school would. I mean, come on, think about that. (laughs) But I was diagnosed roughly three to four months after he and I officially started dating. Right before the diagnosis, my moods began to shift and I was not the most stable. So once I was diagnosed, I remember standing in the courtyard of my high school one day after class and telling him, you know, this is why I've been acting this way. I've been diagnosed with bipolar disorder, but I'm now taking medication to help it all. Which I thought would be, you know, a great idea telling him. You open up about what's been going on with you. You explain to them, yeah, this is why I've been acting this way. And then, ah, light bulb moment. It makes sense now, right? And we can move forward and fix things. Well, that's what I thought was going to happen, but this turned out to be an awful idea. I remember right after I told him, he just looked really uncomfortable and confused by this information. Like he wasn't really sure how to process it, especially right in that moment. And again, the word bipolar disorder labeled as a mental illness definitely freaked him out, as it did most people back when I was first opening up about it a decade ago. 
But before walking away from me to go meet up with his friends, I remember asking him if things were going to be okay between us. And he said, I'm not sure. I need to think about it. Y'all, I was a 16-year-old who was dating this guy that I thought I loved, which... Okay, you were 16 once, so do not judge the ignorance from that statement right there and what I thought a decade ago when I was a child. <laughs> but he told me that he's got to think about our relationship right after I told him that I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Would he have done that, said I had brain cancer in place of bipolar disorder? Would he have questioned everything that had happened between us over the last four months and looked at me so differently the way he did had I said it was cancer or heart disease or a broken bone or something, quote, normal and common, right? No, he probably wouldn't have looked at me differently. He probably would have stuck around and would have dealt with it because he felt bad for me or because it was something that he knew could be fixed or, you know, in the case of cancer, there's treatment options moving forward with it, you know? But because not only the lack of education, but the stigma surrounding mental disorders, homeboy just decided to throw up the peace sign and call it quits. Yep, that's exactly what happened. Nothing like I had hoped for or actually expected. So this is when full-on depression, isolation, and self-loathing began. And I'll touch base more on those feelings and emotions later on. So as you can see, the reactions to telling a friend or two and the boyfriend at the time about my bipolar disorder diagnosis were not the best. And to be honest, I don't have a whole lot more to touch base on with telling friends at this time about my diagnosis because to be honest, I didn't really have a lot of friends back then. Which sounds weird saying now, knowing how many friends I have these days and how many of y'all out there listening are supporting me because you know me personally and are close friends with me. So actually, I'm probably very thankful that I didn't have a whole lot of people I needed to open up and tell this to back then. I think it would have definitely been a lot more detrimental than it was. Although, keep listening and you'll see it doesn't get much easier anytime soon. Now, as for my teachers. So, to be honest, I have no clue if they knew back then. I think they had a hunch, but I'm not 100% sure about whether or not they did. I did reach out to my old high school counselor recently. Mr. Lowell Good from Brazewood High School, and I asked him if parents were required to inform the school when things like this happen, you know, a diagnosis of any sort, especially when it pertains to mental health, which can sometimes affect a child's performance at school. And he told me, which, sidetrack, I have worked in the medical field for a couple of years of my life now, and I'm very familiar with HIPAA. But with HIPAA, they're not allowed to tell anybody about your situation. It's private, confidential, that kind of stuff. It's up to the diagnosee and, you know, whoever's involved personally in relationships with the diagnosee. So what Mr. Good said, which that sounds weird saying, because I've always called him Lowell, and so has everybody else, so scratch that. So what Lowell said was that it's up to the parent whether or not they decide to notify the school. The psychiatrist's office is not allowed to do that, i.e. HIPAA that I just talked about. So to be honest, I don't really think that my parents actually reached out and told the school. I don't know if my parents told anybody for a while, to be honest. My mom probably told her friends, but otherwise I had no idea. Again, shove the secrets under the rug and keep on going. That was our motto, so you get the point. So although I don't have uh, any proof as to whether or not my school teachers back then knew at the time, I think they might have had some kind of hunch because I would often ask my teachers to let me leave their classroom to go to the counselor's office. Usually it was once my work was complete, but sometimes I would ask to leave in the middle of them teaching or lecturing. And that was always due to, you got it, depressive episodes. I didn't know how to handle them or what to do, but I definitely cried a lot when they came around, especially after the boyfriend at the time broke it off with me. I could not handle that, and as you can picture any dramatic 16-year-old reacting to a breakup, just times that by three. Because if you know me well enough, you know that I'm insanely overdramatic. And if you don't know me well enough, well, you're about to learn that I'm very overdramatic. But it was really embarrassing to be seen crying during class when just little outbursts would happen like that. So that's when I would ask to go to the counselor's office because I knew it was a safe place for me to be. 
I knew that being in the counselor's office, it was not just a safe place, but I could sit there, I could cry, and I could just talk about what I was going through without anybody seeing me, number one, the most important part of this, but number two, without being judged. I didn't have a therapist at this time, so my counselor, low good, was equivalent to a therapist for me back then. Just because he listened, and again, without judgment. That is the most important part about the listening factor, guys, is that he listened to me without judging me on what I was going through. So, Lowell, I just want to say thank you for being there for me during all those years. You were my go-to counselor, and I spent countless hours in your office over these years, and I wanted to thank you for being there and doing that for me. I know it was kind of your job, but... I was in your office, gosh, probably every other day, if not every day. And had I not had you around to like listen to me as to what was happening and so I could feel safe somewhere, I don't know where I'd be today. So thank you. Also, I just wanted to stop and say a big thank you to all of the high school, middle school, and elementary school counselors out there. Y'all do amazing work, and it takes some really special, loving individuals to do what you guys do, and we appreciate you. I say we because I'm speaking for everyone when I say that. Whether or not they realize it in the moment, they appreciate you, I appreciate you, we appreciate you. Keep on doing what you're doing. You're doing great. Well, now that you've heard how painful some of my first experiences with opening up about my disorder were, let's talk about a few things that would have been helpful for both me and for those in my life at the time. So if you have been recently diagnosed and you're afraid of telling those loved ones you have around you about it, I totally get that. If you didn't catch that by listening to this whole episode, I want you to hit pause, restart it, and listen again. I get it. Telling people can be scary, especially if you put any expectations into it like I did, thinking that it would make things better when clearly it did the opposite in some cases. But you can't keep this a secret forever. You really can't. And I recommend choosing the first one you tell about this diagnosis of yours very wisely. Make sure that you 100% trust them. You know, I didn't know what trust was back then, but boy, I sure wish I did. Because after telling a few people and getting the not so nice reactions that I did, I feared that these people would leak my secret out without my permission. Which, guys, first of all, it's not a big secret you should be holding. You can't hold something like this in forever. But also, if you tell people that you don't trust something that's very important to you and something very valuable to you, and then you fear that they might tell other people or try to use it against you, that causes not just issues with dramatic occurrences with other people, but that can also lead to trust issues within yourself, which cause more issues later down the line with relationships in the future. That is one of the mistakes I made. So again, while I didn't really know what trust was back when I was 16, I really wish I would have learned or had someone teach me what it actually meant to trust somebody. That would have saved me a good eight or nine years of trust issues with friendships and relationships and boyfriends down the line. But let me just remind you that your diagnosis is your information and no one else's. That's why I really recommend you start by telling those that you truly 100% trust first. Because it's going to be uncomfortable and it's going to be awkward the first couple conversations talking to people about this. But you'll get used to it. It gets easier the more you do it. It's like riding a bike. You know, when you go ride a bike, the first, I mean, okay, backtrack. I don't know who learns how to ride a bike as an adult, but I'm sure there are people out there who do. Most of us learn how to ride a bike as a kid. But if you think back to those days, to when you were first starting to ride your bike, it was hard. You didn't know really how to keep the balance. You had to pedal. You had to do so many things at once. But every day, you got up and you practiced. And the more you practiced, the easier it became. That's the exact same with talking about mental health. If you have an issue, a disorder, a struggle, anything, and you choose to shy away and to hide it within, Yeah, it's going to be really hard to talk about, especially if you let it bottle up inside of you for years. Once you do start talking about it and you start slowly letting some of that, you know, steam out, it just gets easier and easier and it's no longer awkward and you start to accept that part of you. Because once you're diagnosed with a mental disorder, guys, it's usually pretty stuck with you. 
So choosing to ignore the fact is very ignorant and ignorance is not bliss. So again, I encourage you, if anybody out there is struggling or has been diagnosed but has chosen not to really tell anybody about this, I really encourage you to start talking. It'll be very helpful for you and for those around you. So if your child is the one that has been diagnosed and is currently still in school, but keep in mind, so first of all, summer's coming. Second of all, global pandemic. So <laughs> this tip that I am recommending, which again, I'm not a professional. It's just a recommendation based upon my experience as a child who was diagnosed with a mental disorder. But after the pandemic, when they go back to school, I recommend letting their teachers know Mental health is becoming more widely known, and I feel that informing them won't do any harm. It would probably actually help, especially if they have a patient and understanding teacher. As you heard, talking to my school counselor regularly helped me a lot, so I don't see why informing the people who spend the most time with your kids throughout the week would be a bad thing. Again, you're the parent, that is your call, and it's also situational, it kind of depends on what the child has been diagnosed with. Just keep in mind that it's helpful to know because if they know, they can figure out ways to help your kid learn better and adapt to the environment easier. If they don't know, then they're confused as to why the child might be acting a certain way and that can just cause a lot of harm. Not knowing tends to cause a lot of harm, whereas knowing what's going on can bring forth ideas in order to get solutions to solve any problems that might be arising. Now, if you encounter a situation where someone important in your life opens up to you about their struggles or a recent diagnosis that they've been given, first of all, I just want you to listen to them. I want you to listen with an open mind. They need you to tell you that you love them and that you're here for them and that you support them and that you'll help them through it. That is what they need from you the most. And ask them questions like, what do you need from me? How can I be there to support you? Is there anything I can do to help make this journey easier for you? And don't just ask those questions, y'all. Because yes, while it is very important to ask these questions, because it does help the other person feel safe and it helps them to know that you're there for them, but be sure to act on their responses. That's the most important thing that you can do. Listen to them without judgment. Ask them how you can help and then make adjustments in the relationship where needed in order to support the other person. Okay, well, thank you for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, take a screenshot of it, post it on your Instagram and tag me at distressed to joyful underscore Bailey's way. And don't forget to include your thoughts. Also hit that cute little subscribe button up there so that you can stay updated with the latest episode releases. Next episode, we're going to learn about what it was like for me the first time depression hit and how it affected me. We'll learn some self-awareness techniques in order to figure out what your triggers are. We'll also learn what triggers are if you don't know what triggers are and what I mean by that. Plus, we'll learn some helpful tips on ways to keep yourself or someone you know from slipping completely down into the depression sinkhole. All right, well, until next time... Take it easy, stay grateful, and be joyful.